Keith Becker, the general manager of Dee Dee's. AB 1482, the Tenant Protection Act of 2019, is a very complicated law, but it can be broken down into five major subject matters. Today, in this segment, we're going to talk about no-fault relocations. First, before we get into subject itself, we are so very early into this process. It goes into effect as of January 1st of the year 2020, and it, it, it lasts for at least 10 years, if not longer. We are so early in that we do not have case law. We do not have real-world examples. So these are the best recommendations and best practices right now. They may be subject to change as real world impacts. Secondly, every situation is unique. If you have legal questions, please contact your attorney. From the top, AB 1482 is indeed a rent control law. It caps the amount that you can increase rents to no more than 5% plus CPI, CPI being Consumer Price Index. In addition to rent increase caps, there's also the just cause eviction component limiting the reasons why a housing provider might request or require a tenant to vacate the premises. And in those instances where it is a no fault eviction, what we're talking about right now, the landlord, the housing provider will be required to provide relocation costs to the tenant. If you have a property that is required that is recognized as non-exempt under AB 1482, the regulations adherent to 1482 apply, you are obligated to include this verbiage into your rental contract with your tenants. It has to be in using these words, this verbiage, 12 point font, and for new and renewing contracts, it must be in place by July 1st. For month to month tenancies, it has to be in place by August 1st. Month to month tenancies that are already established now. My, perp my recommendation basically is do it now. There's no reason to delay. So getting the property back, if you have a property that falls under AB 1482, is you've got two very limited categories that define how you might get the property back. There is the concept of at fault just cause evictions, which is tenant behavioral issues, and we've talked about that in a different segment. And then there is no fault evictions, which is the owner's choice. There is a limited number of reasons why an owner might choose and be required or requesting to get the premises back. Any termination of tenancy that is generated based upon the no fault just cause will require the owner to pay to the tenant relocation costs and the relocation costs based upon AB 1482 are in an amount equal to what the tenant last paid for monthly rent. The reasons that you as a housing provider might be permitted to on a no fault basis request the, the occupancy of the property back include the intent to occupy the property by the owner or spouse, domestic partner, parents, children, grandchildren, or grandparents. And this doesn't mean nieces, nephews, in-laws, extended family. It's specific to those individuals. Now, what's interesting about this particular clause is that AB 1482 says you're only permitted to ask the tenant to leave for the move-in of one of your relatives if the tenant agrees. How do they agree? Remember how I said earlier about having this verbiage in the contract? What if, in addition to having that verbiage, you add, this lease may be terminated if, da, 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 da. Adding, these, adding this clause in with it, same thing, 12 point font. That is part of your verbiage that goes into each and every contract thereafter. Now, the addition of this clause, allowing the owner um, to have family move in, is considered to be proper notice and acceptance by the tenant. If you put it into the contract, the tenant by default, by having this in their contract, it is presumed to be their acceptance. Furthermore, we talked previously about at-fault evictions. 
and the fact if you provide to a tenant a lease extension which is functionally identical to what they had in place, adding this verbiage for family members is considered to be functionally identical. So a tenant can't say, oh, I'm not going to sign it because you put that line in. If they say, no, I'm not going to sign it, that's an at-fault eviction basis to remove the tenant. In addition to having family members move in, you're still allowed to withdraw the property from the rental market. The Ellis Act is still in effect. It has not been overruled. You can decide that you no longer want to be a landlord. Here's the notice to your tenant. You must leave. But you have to be able to prove that you're taking it off the market. You can't just leave it dormant for six months and then come back. It will get you in trouble. You can get out of the business, ask the tenant to leave, pay relocation costs. You can ask a tenant to leave if you are intending to demolish or substantially remodel the property. Now, substantial remodel does not include putting in new carpet, painting the property, and hanging new window coverings. It includes structural, electrical, electrical plumbing, mechanical systems, abatement of hazardous materials, lead, mold, asbestos, and it is something that would be required to be permitted and it cannot reasonably be accomplished in a safe manner with the tenants in place and the length of time for the project would be at least 30 days or more. So this is not something where basically you want to you know, put in new carpet. That's a couple of days. It's not something where you want to put in the new kitchen. That's a week. This is something where you're talking about a serious and severe project only. The owner's mandatory compliance with a government action or a court order is a reason why an owner may give the tenant notice to vacate. For example, a notice relating to habitability. Heaven forbid the property is red tagged. Um, a court order that requires the vacating of the property. Now bear in mind, I'm having trouble thinking of examples of these types of instances because I haven't had, for example, a court order telling me that the property must be vacated in even the many years that I've done this. But AB 1482 was written to allow for these types of possibilities. A local ordinance, not a court order, but an ordinance requiring the vacating of the property. That might be, for example, something like eminent domain. However, if it is determined by the governmental agency or the court that the tenant is at fault for whatever the conditions are that require the owner to vacate the property. The property gets red tagged, but it gets red tagged because the tenant has rewired the entire house because they've got a grow room in each one of the bedrooms and the property gets red tagged. The tenant in that instance is not eligible for relocation assistance. So relocation costs. If an owner issues a termination notice based upon the permission, you know, based upon one of these permissible no fault causes, the owner shall do one of the following. And I underline shall because it's written into AB 1482 that way, and shall means something very specific. Shall means you must, not it's a good idea, not oh, you forgot, don't worry about it. It is this is the way it must be. You shall either Provide to the tenant a direct payment equal to the last full month's rent that that tenant paid to the housing provider, or you will waive in writing to the tenant the payment of their final month prior to the rent coming due. If the owner chooses to waive the rent, the owner shall provide a notice stating the dollar figure of what that amount of rent is and that no rent is due for the final month. It is in writing and it is provided to the tenant. If, on the other hand, the owner decides to make the direct payment to the tenant, the payment must be made to the tenant within 15 days of the notice to vacate. Yes, this is before the tenant vacates. You give the notice to vacate, no more than 15 days later, you give them the money. If the tenant fails to vacate at the time that they are supposed to vacate, You've given them either a waiver of the renter or you've given them money 
and they refuse to vacate and you wind up having an at-fault eviction at that point, you're entitled to demand that relocation consideration back. Of course, that becomes part of a court process and it's part of the process. It's imprecise. It's one of those cases of, yeah, really? Um, but it is written into the, uh, it's written into the law to say, if they don't carry that end, you're not still required to have paid them the relocation uh, uh, assistance. Furthermore, this relocation assistance, there's not going to be double dipping. Let's imagine that you've got a city and the city, oh, like Healdsburg, for example, is thinking about having relocation assistance and the relocation assistance is not one month, it's three months. It's not, the tenant does not get one month from AB 1482 and three months from Healdsburg. The relocation costs that are allowed and required by 1482 will be deducted from any additional um, allowances that a local jurisdiction might also uh, require. So, for example, if the city of Healdsburg says you have to pay three months, you're paying one month based upon AB 1482, and you're paying the remaining two months based upon the Healdsburg Ordinance. You do not have a larger amount. Now, like I said about shall, and this is the way AB 1482 is written, the owner's failure to strictly comply with this procedure shall render the notice of termination void. It basically says there is no room for error. Accordingly, if you have questions, if you need help, if you feel that this is something that somebody else should be helping you take care with, contact a professional property manager. Contact your real estate agent. We'd be glad to help. And, especially in these types of situations, where it's been said, you shall, if you've got a legal issue, contact your attorney. I'm Keith Becker from Diddy's.